Hi there, my name is Victoria Bowler and today we are looking at some strategies for sharing classroom instruments. This might be interesting to you if your access to instruments is limited or if you're just looking for some ways to streamline your lesson process and be a little bit more efficient with class time. If your instrument collection is on the smaller side, then you might find yourself caught between two kind of trains of thought. Uh, maybe wanting to give students as many instrumental experiences as you can, but then also maybe not wanting to go through the hassle of passing things out and dealing with students who are bored as they wait and trying to figure out who's had a turn with what instrument and what game. Even though working with a small collection of instruments can feel like a headache sometimes, there are actually some ways that we can use this to our advantage, and it just depends on how we structure the sharing. For one thing, it gives us the chance to focus on individual students playing techniques, since we only need to notice a small group of students at a time. And it can give us more chances to give students individualized instruction if we see that they need help. We might be able to notice things if we are only watching a group of six as opposed to a group of 24. Right? Students can also hear themselves a lot better if there are only a few instruments playing at a time, and that goes a really long way in developing independent and interdependent musicianship. And then one of my favorite reasons for keeping a small number of instruments in rotation is that classroom management can actually be easier when not everyone has the opportunity to play an instrument at the same time. Because we want everyone in the room to be respectful of the classroom materials. And so because of that, we're going to have some criteria that students need to meet before they can play an instrument. And this can be a big motivator for students in terms of behavior because for the most part, they are all interested in playing an instrument. So they are naturally motivated to show that they are ready to use it responsibly. Let's look at some principles for sharing instruments. These are good to keep in mind across the board, whether we are working with pitched or unpitched percussion and regardless of the specific grade level that we're working with. Number one, everyone has a job. With a small collection of instruments, we want to be sure that every single student has something to do, even if that thing is not playing an instrument. A lot of the time, a really easy job is just to have students continue to do whatever scaffold they were doing before they got the instrument. And that goes back to the benefit of classroom management and interdependent skill development, like we talked about earlier. Because as a student, if I know that the instrument can come to me eventually, then I'm going to want to show that I am ready for it. Right? So both from a classroom behavior and from a musical behavior standpoint, there's a readiness that we're going to want to see in order to know that students will be successful. So uh, I mentioned the scaffold. There are lots of different options for what students can be doing if they don't have an instrument. And the specific job that we choose is going to be dependent on our goals for that lesson and the lesson segment and why we chose that song to begin with. But for example, if I want my lesson segment to target rhythm versus beat, well, students can practice that with or without an instrument, right? So asking musicians with an instrument to pat a steady beat and people without an instrument to play the rhythm of the words, that's going to serve my lesson purpose and it gives everyone a job. So if you're not sure what job to give, thinking about the scaffold for the instrument can be helpful. Here are a few options that can get us started when we think about scaffolds and giving everyone a job. We might have students pat a steady beat while the person next to them plays a rhythm, or we could have students sing the main song. We could have them sing the song on letter names or on solfege. Um, we could do a movement activity or play the singing game, or we could have students clap along to the ostinato that the rest of the students with instruments are playing. A lot of what we're talking about today has some element of part work pedagogy. Um, and so just a note here, episode 28 of Elemental Conversations talks about teaching a part work piece on barred instruments. And that gets into some of the scaffolds, some of the steps that we might think about when we're teaching an instrumental piece. So if you are kind of unsure of what those earlier scaffolds might look like, or if that topic would be interesting to you, you can certainly check that out. I will link it below. And I will also also link episode 29 um, because that talks about steps to singing harmony and that might be helpful here as well. Anytime we're working with instruments, students are going to need to know how to meet our expectations. 
This is not a list that's set in stone, but just for starters, you might clarify expectations for things like how to show that you are ready for an instrument, how to hold the instrument when you're playing, and equally important, how to hold the instrument when you are not playing. Uh, we could talk about how to pass off the instrument to a friend. And then an important one is um, what is an appropriate behavioral response if you are not chosen for an instrument. So how will students show you or someone else that they are ready to play an instrument? This might be like holding a quiet thumbs up or a silent high five. Um, and just a quick note here, if our directions to show that you are ready for an instrument are to show a quiet thumbs up and you are saying me, 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 right? That isn't silent, yeah? So there's some classroom management here. There's a, a benefit in terms of classroom management for sure. You could have the expectation that students are going to sing the song with their very best singing voice or um, they participate in the game or the movement activity. It could be uh, as well what we just talked about, this scaffold before you get the instrument. So whatever you choose to use as your cue that students are ready for an instrument, that musical involvement is really important because students are, first of all, just listening to directions and then the scaffold that we choose, it serves as an assessment so that we can see if students are ready for the instrument or not. So if I set the expectation that I will know you're ready for an instrument after you sing the song and pat the steady beat, and then I see someone with a super inconsistent steady beat when they're patting, that gives me an indication that their steady beat is also not going to be consistent when they transfer it to the drum. And they can still play the drum, they can still participate with the instrument as long as they were doing their best with the scaffold before. But now I know how I can support them when they do get the instrument. Next, we'll have expectations for holding the instrument and what to do with the instrument when you are not playing. What is it like to hold an instrument but not make a sound? Rest position is really important to establish right away because it is very easy to come out of rest position. <laughs> and this makes sense, right? It is more fun to play an instrument than to sit there and hold the instrument and not play it, right? So one of our strategies that we can use, and we've talked about this before in a previous video, but we will just highlight the behavior that we want to see, that we want students to continue. So phrases like, oh wow, I'm looking around the circle and so many people are in rest position. Or I can see someone holding their sticks at their shoulder, but they're not making any sound, right? Just describe what you see. When we're passing instruments to a friend, there is a physical component here, like a physical safety component here, because we want students to handle the instruments respectfully. Right? But there's also a social component here that students can consider, that they can consider with you and with each other. When you pass the instrument off, are you going to pass to your very best friend every single time? Or are you going to think about passing to someone that maybe you don't normally play with on the playground? Maybe uh, for today, you decide that you're going to pass to someone that you have not talked to yet today. That would be interesting, right? And we can talk a little bit more about this point in a moment. Last, how are we going to respond if we don't get an instrument? This last expectation is interesting to me. Some common phrases that we've probably all heard are things like, she always gets a turn and I never get a turn. And there are probably some behaviors that we've seen more than once as well. Things like crying when you don't get a chance to play an instrument or being really, really mad and not wanting to participate in the next round of the game, right? Something that can really help that we might not think about is to literally practice what to do when you don't get an instrument. And as silly as it sounds to us as an adult, right? Because we have um, emotional regulation, we have better behavioral regulation, hopefully. Um, and that idea of practicing what to do when you're angry, what to do when you're disappointed, that can seem kind of silly to us. It's like a no brainer, but it's actually a really good idea to do some role playing in that scenario. So as a class, we can pretend that the person next to you has an instrument and you don't. And not even that they have an instrument and you don't, but you really, really wanted that instrument. And maybe you are kind of scared that perhaps you will never get to play that instrument ever, right? So what should we do? We can help students practice those scenarios before they find themselves in a really heightened emotional place. 
It's okay to feel disappointed. It's okay to feel angry. When we feel disappointed and angry, what is the expectation for our behavior? One of the headaches of a small instrument collection is trying to figure out who should get what instrument and when, and who's already had a turn and going through the hassle of passing out instruments to each student, right? That can be really time consuming and it can bog the lesson down. So one of the easiest solutions to this is just to delegate that responsibility back to the students. This can happen really easily within the context of a song or a game. So to tie this in with the first point, because everyone has a job if we're doing it within the context of, let's say, a singing game. So let's say that we are all singing and playing a game to Here Comes a Bluebird. And you might have most of the class in that circle playing the singing game. And then maybe you have one student on a Bordeaux, and then maybe you have five or so playing an ostinato on rhythm sticks. And then at the end of the game, it's a huge time saver for those five students with rhythm sticks to just hand them to someone else instead of us doing it individually. Another benefit to this, and again to tie into the last point, students are doing the classroom management for us because they're going to hand the sticks to someone who shows that they are ready. So whatever expectation we set to show readiness, like a quiet thumbs up or whatever it is, that's the behavior that students are looking for in order to pass off the instrument. Students also just tend to be a little bit more attentive to peers making decisions as opposed to always having the teacher make every single tiny little detailed choice all the time. So we've talked about principles for sharing instruments. Now let's look at some specific structures that we can use actually inside each lesson. The first thing to talk about is using games. Here we are talking about games like uh, choosing games or elimination games or guessing games or chasing games, something where someone is chosen or out in some way. These types of singing games are really, really useful to us when it's time to share instruments because the game takes care of that choice for us. And then along those same lines, almost any singing game can be adapted for sharing instruments. We just change the directions to be this time when you are out, you are going to play the instrument. And then the instrument students can play a Bordeaux, they might play an ostinato, um, they could improvise a melody while the rest of us continue to play the game, or they might improvise as a B section between rounds of the game, um, or they might just play a steady beat, right? It just depends on the purpose of your lesson and why you chose that game to begin with. The second structure we might use is doubling up. We might have more than one student playing an instrument at the same time with partners or a small group. This can happen on pitched percussion, but it can also happen on unpitched percussion. So an example of this could be that two or three students are seated behind a barred instrument, and let's say that they are figuring out a melody by ear. And so in this case, maybe one student has the mallets, and then the other students in the group are singing and signing soulfish to help that barred instrument player and then they just pass the mallets back and forth. They're taking turns. If you have more than one instrumental part going at once, then rotating stations are a great way to share instruments. We mentioned a similar structure earlier when, when we were talking about students choosing their replacement for instruments with Bluebird Bluebird, or Here Comes a Bluebird, I forget. Uh, that was in the context of a singing game where if you were playing the game and you didn't have an instrument, you still had a job, right? But we can also do a similar idea with rotating stations. And this can be as simple or complex as we want it to be from a musical perspective. We can layer in different stations, we could add partner rhythms, we can have people playing the melody, or we could have people improvising. All of that works, right? We can layer on whatever we want, or we can make it more simple. So let's go the simple route. Let's imagine that we are working with Cinco Pa Prep in Alabama Gal. And for this activity, we'll have two stations for instruments and two stations for singing. So let's imagine that you only have six barred instruments. Totally fine. Those six instruments go off to one side of the room and those six students at the instrument are gonna play a chord bordeaux. And then when they're done with that barred instrument station, they'll rotate to the next station where they sit and they sing the song while they pat a steady beat or they clap the rhythm of the words they can choose. And then when they're done with that, they move to the third station. The third station is rhythm sticks where students whisper and play an ostinato, Alabama gal, rest, Alabama gal. 
rest. And then when they're done with that, they go to the last station, which is singing and patting the steady beat or singing and clapping the rhythm of the words. Same thing as before. So we are alternating here, instruments, singing, instruments, singing. This is a really simple structure. We're just going to pass out a few instruments around the circle and then students sing the song while they play the instrument. And then when they're done playing the instrument, they just pass it to the person on their right. This is really easy to do in the context of a warm up. You'll just place the instruments, however many you have, around the circle. And in the warm up, students are going to walk around the circle and then you'll motion for them to stop. If you have an instrument in front of you, you pick it up and you do your regular warm up routine with your echoing, your improvisation, all of that stuff. And then after a while, you'll just motion for students to hand that instrument off to the person on their right. And you can continue around the circle for a few rounds. It'll depend on how many instruments you have, but you can continue around the circle for a few rounds so that students get a chance to play. So that's in a warm up, but you can also do the same structure with a song or a rhyme. Like let's take BB Bumblebee. So instead of playing the game, the students are going to play a steady beat on their instrument and then pass that instrument to the person on their right for the next round of the game. And with older students, this works as well, right? I know that was a BB Bumblebee example, but you might have students who have an instrument improvise instead of playing a steady beat, or they could read a partner rhythm from the board, or they could play an ostinato while the rest of the class sings a song. Okay, so the structures that we talked about for sharing instruments are using games, doubling up, using stations, and then passing to the right. We talked about those structures after we looked at some of these principles for sharing instruments. And those were making sure everyone has a job, setting expectations, and letting students take over some of that choice for us. Okay, that's it. If you have a comment that you would like to share, I would love to hear from you. You can drop it below. You can find me on Instagram. I am at Victoria Bowler, or you can shoot me an email. I am Victoria at VictoriaBowler.com. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.